we'll go ahead and sort of get things kicked off. I was talking to a few people and said, oh, it's nice out today. So, you know, maybe people will come, maybe they'll find something better to do. But, you know, it was minus five last week and we had the room full. So apparently cold weather is the secret. So next week, make sure it's cold, bring everyone back. So, uh, but yeah, thanks again for coming. Uh, this is the, the third in our series. Uh, this one's all focused on farm economics. So usually this is one of our most popular topics because it's on the minds of everyone, especially when economics is more and more important than, than ever. So uh, yeah, so a couple things as you uh, saw the snacks back there, if you're new today, uh, to thank uh, United Farm and Ranch Management. There's a few folks kind of scattered around. Chris is standing up in the back. They're, uh, they're our sponsor today and we'll have them share a little bit um, right before our break here in a bit. We'll have them share a little bit about uh, what they do and uh, Chris can share some things about him as well. So uh, again, thanks to them for uh, sponsoring today. Uh, our first speaker is going to be Alvin Olick. If you haven't heard Al speak, you probably haven't been around very long. Uh, Al's a regular here. You're here at least three or four at least three or four times a year, I think we have you you come in and talk about something. So once or twice, yeah. Okay. So anyway, so I'll be talking a little bit about uh, about farm transition, and I'll transition your slides here in a minute. So uh, again, feel free to to jump in with questions. We'll again we'll we'll shoot for about ten o'clock, and then we'll uh, again have a discussion with you uh, farm, and then we'll also take a break, and then Brad Lubin will be our second speaker today, and we'll be talking a little bit about farm bill and farm policy. So. With that, uh, if anyone has any questions, again, feel free to ask. If not, we're going to go ahead and get it started, and I'll get your PowerPoint up going yeah, for thanks. you. So. Okay, so I have a microphone on, and I don't know if it's coming through the house speaker or not. Is it coming through up there? Okay, good. All right. Yeah, it's not a traditional farm management talk this morning because I feel I feel different today because normally where I'm supposed to stay on this side. Is that correct? You got well, the microphone? You're, you're good. All Mostly right. this side. But you're okay, okay, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll try and stay over here on this side because they're trying to tape me too. So most of the time when I come here and talk, I come and talk about uh, land management, uh, what's happening with uh, cash rental rates, what a good farm lease looks like, and all those kinds of things, that kind of pure farm management and, and land management. But, but uh, about a year ago now, early February 2017, uh, the bosses in Lincoln wanted to ask me if I would consider uh, moving to a different role. And they asked me if I would consider working on farm succession, farm transition full time. And they said, uh, I said, so do I stay in Columbus? And they said, no, we want you to come to Philly Hall. We want you to be a part of the Ag Econ staff and talk about that on a statewide basis. And so I was asked to move. I can tell I'm going to sweat like crazy if I don't just ditch this. So let's just ditch this and have Oh, I better take the mic with me. That'd be a good idea. This I mean, I'd just be a wreck, so I'll still be, I'll still be too wet, but that's fine. Um, so, um, I don't know how that's going to work. Is that, uh, let's go, let's do it differently. Okay, let's try that. So, I, uh, we, Mindy, my wife and I just talked about, what do we, do we want to live in Columbus until we retire? Or do we want to live in Lincoln? And where do we want to live in retirement? Well, the bottom line was we talked about, we've kind of always talked about, we've been married for 40 years now. We talked about being in Columbus in retirement, or excuse me, being in Lincoln in retirement. So the university's offering to move you. So you say, okay, well, let's go, let's go get it done now. Not what we planned, but it's how it worked out. So I've been in Lincoln since last July, about six months, six and a half months now. Um, so I'm talking about farm succession and transition, although I love my, I love my work in uh, farm management in terms of talking about lease arrangements. <sighs> Last fall, I was, I was going to start, start with a story like I always do. I, I, I illustrate everything I talk about by telling a story, and so I have to start with a story like I always do. And last fall, I was, I was asked to be a guest lecturer on campus. And I got done with my talk with that particular class, and an 18, little 18-year-old 18 freshman girl raises her hand and she says, I have something to tell you, Alan. I said, what's that? Well, here's the deal. My, I'm not, I, when I'm home and I'm driving down the gravel road and I'm eating one of my cousins, my first cousins, I'm not allowed to wave at them anymore. I can't even acknowledge them. I can't even say hi. Uh, we, just, we just have to pass without any acknowledgement. I said, what happened? Well, my, my dad and his brother, my uncle, uh, had a disagreement. 
I said, what caused the disagreement? Well, grandpa and grandma had two farms, and they had two sons that farmed. So they're going to give a quarter to each son. But they didn't say how that was supposed to be given. They just said, give a quarter to each son. So that's all they specified in their will. And so the lawyer followed the will. He put quarter one in a hat, number, number one in a hat. He put number two in a hat, and he had each son draw out a quarter because that's what they was told to do. You get, he didn't say which one went to who. Just draw a number out of the hat. That's what you get. Well, one quarter was good. It had great dirt, had a pivot on it. The well was great, great production, good, good ground. Uh, everything was awesome. The other quarter, still 160 acres, but and it had a pivot, but it was on bad soil, sandy spots, and the well sucked air. No, not a good well. It was a sandy, it was a sandy, sand, you know, the, the well wasn't deep enough or whatever the problem was. It wasn't in a good spot. Doesn't matter. It was a bad well. And you have that in Nebraska. You can't even get water in most places in Lancaster County. So you understand what I'm talking about there. The point is, um, the two brothers got into a fight on how that went down and family split. That's it. We're not, we're not talking to each other anymore, period. So, I tell that story, not so you feel bad for the girl, but you think about what happened there. So let's talk about what happened there. Who screwed that up? Parents screwed that up. When I gave this talk in Norfolk the other day, the, somebody, somebody in the front row goes, the, the, the lawyer screwed that up. But that, that could be true too. But, but uh, well, I would say the parents lawyer because he didn't give them good advice in my view, but the parents screwed that up. Either, in my view, one of two things should happen to create not this problem. One, either one, Number one, either the parents need to go to the children and say, hey, you're going to get a quarter. Are you okay with that or not? Because if you're not, we're not giving it to you. Be happy with what you get and shut up. Or number two, or number two my preferred method would be to go, we're going to have, at our demise, we want each quarter appraised. You're each going to get a quarter. You want each quarter appraised. And if it's a, whatever that difference is in value for each quarter, and when you're going to split the difference, and the guy that has the more um, the more valuable quarter will give that half that difference to the other person. So if it's eighty thousand dollar difference in the value of the quarter, you split it in half. Forty thousand. That's what he needs to pay his brother. So there'd be some equity there, some some degree of uh, equalness, fairness, whatever you want to call it. So the important thing here to talk about that's not in my slides, but should be remember remembered, is just simply this. When we have discussions about what's going to happen to the farm, when we have discussions about what's going to happen to our stuff, and we need to have a conversation with our family, we have to remember that the first conversation with our family shouldn't be about how it's going to get divided. The first conversation with our family should be, when we get done with this, are we going to have a family or not? That's the first conversation we have to have. Are we going to have a family or not? I didn't put that in your slides, but it should be. I got to I gotta start including it from now on. Let's have that discussion first before we start talking about what we're going to do with any of the assets. Okay? So that's what I wanted to kind of start off with. Okay, so here's our topics. We're going to talk about when we're going to retire, how what that looks like, uh, what I want to be when I have some things about goals, uh, some things about generations, some things about family communications, the whole fair versus equal argument, assignments. We're no good unless we do something with the stuff we have today. And so at the end, I'll give you very clear ideas on what you need to do next if you haven't started working on this process. This is not going to be a substitute for actual estate planning. It's not a substitute. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to be a lawyer. Okay? I don't want to be a lawyer. Quite honestly, it's too complicated. I don't get it. I'm not that smart. But... Um, if I can give you some good information on how to get started, you can make better use of your lawyer's time, be more efficient, and you will be uh, better able to go to a lawyer and save yourself some hours with a lawyer because a lawyer is going to cost you a minimum 150 bucks an hour on up. Most of them I hear are 200, 200, 250, 300 bucks an hour. That's right here. A minimum 150. So if I save you an hour, your whole registration fee, not for today, but for the entire series, is paid. Think about that. You know, right? What do you charge them? Twenty-five bucks for the whole thing, or something? Well, they can pay in cash, and they can charge more. All right. <laughs> yeah. 
So I hope that we're making good use of your time with your professional. That's the whole point. In Iowa, they did a survey relatively recently at uh, farmers, and what they talked, what that survey showed was that there's a full 31% that never plan to retire at all. They hope to go out in the cab. Tractor, I'm going to die in the cab, pull me out feet first. Another 20, uh, let's see, another 46, 47% are going to semi retire. I can't give it completely up, but I might give away my livestock, get out of my livestock and give away, give away on my rented ground, and I'll just stick with my home place or whatever. They're going to keep puttering. They're still using their 44, 40 combine, 4,400 combines and their 6,600 combines and their 44 to 40 tractors and their 4020s and stuff like that. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. I'm just telling you, they don't plan to ever just fully quit. And only about 23% plan to fully retire. Critical. For lots of reasons, people are not are choosing not to retire. I met with a family up right north of Wahoo in December, I think, maybe late November. Spent an hour with them, hour and a half with them. And they just said, the, the, the guy was the same age as I am, early 60s. And he goes, you know, I, this has gotten so good. This has been so, this is so much fun right now. I'm going to go another 10 years probably. I'm going to go to at least to my early 70s. Because with this auto steer thing on the GPS and all that, farming is actually fun. I can't not do this. This is awesome. I mean, why would I go through all those decades of no cab and no power steering and no anything and, and give this up now? This is crazy. And I don't have to cultivate anymore? That's crazy good. I mean, getting away from cultivator blights worth everything for us, some of us older guys that understand what cultivator blight is. So um, there you got it. The more scary part is that, however, we're not doing a lot of planning. And the scary part is when we do start planning, more often than not, planning tends to be deferred until some critical life event which forces the family to address the matter. So now you have a disaster, some kind of bad thing has happened, and now you've got to deal with it. Well, guess what? It happened to my family, too. When my mom and dad decided to, when they started working on getting their stuff to my brother and myself, my brother farms by Dorchester on the place where I grew up. So the problem here is I'm only about 28 miles from where I, where I grew up on the farm, so I'm not really an expert anymore. I'm not quite far enough away, but we'll, we'll keep going. The point is to put up with me. That's all I'm saying. So the point is, they, they dealt with this in 1990 when my dad got diagnosed with Alzheimer's. That's when he did it. That was the critical life event that caused my, my, my family to have to deal with, my mom and dad to deal with this. And they know from his diagnosis that he only had about two or three months to make, to make a decision so his signature would still be valid because his brain's going to go pretty fast. And so they hurry up and got some stuff made. And so I have a farm assigned to me in the in middle of Sling County. My brother's got the rest of it, and he, I rent it to him. I'm doing the farm show in Norfolk on Wednesday, and the guy comes up to me afterwards, and he says, i got to get this going. I said, how come? I'm on borrowed time. I said, why are you on borrowed time? This guy was probably 10 years younger than I was. He said, see right here? That's been cut wide open. Had a heart attack last year. Probably shouldn't even be here. But I'm still around, but i got to get this done. Okay. Then he started telling me the rest of his story. We don't do it. We haven't done it because we don't like to plan. We think it's complicated. It's mental work. It's not the work we normally do. Most of the time, we're just out there producing. And now we got to think about this other stuff. We have to think about our demise. We have to think about our death. We have to think about life after we're here. Uh, and that's, that's not pleasant. We don't want to do that. We just don't want to think about all those things. My survey that I did last fall, and I needed to do some more digging into what, it, what else it said, but one thing I pulled out of there was that even those half have an estate plan, half don't. And if half don't, that's a bad plan. When I talk to people after they've been to my workshop and after they've done some work with an attorney, the number one thing they say is, this is great, this is awesome, I'm glad I did something, but I wish I would have done it 10 years ago. I would have had a lot more options. If you don't have everything kind of planned out, don't pass go, don't collect $200, go get something done. It's really important to have something going on this. Here's, here's what happens, here, because here's what happens to people. 
I should have a plan. I should go to a meeting. I've gone to the meeting. Oh, there's a lot to learn. It's really complicated. And so you stop and then you recycle back. And then at some point in time in the future, you go, I should have a plan. I should go to a meeting. Oh, geez, there's still a lot of stuff to remember and a lot of stuff to do and a lot of stuff to think about. So you recycle back or you fall into this trap. To me, with my lawyer, I pay my lawyer 200 bucks an hour. I met with the lawyer. Man, there's a lot to do. I don't want, I don't want to do. I don't know. And you go into the same kind of a loop. If you're in one of these two loops, don't, I'm not being critical of you. Matter of fact, I was in those loops for about five years before I got myself out. I was in the first loop for a while. And then I was in the second loop for a while. And finally, three years ago, I got my wife to go with me to, to the lawyer in Columbus. And we got everything kind of worked. We're set now. But you can get in those loops. Be careful. What I'd rather have you do is, unfortunately, you either have a, you get a plan together or there's been a catastrophic event. I go to a meeting or a lawyer or both. I get my plan developed. That's what we want you to have happen. We want to get you out of those negative. Not negative. There's nothing negative about that. I just want you to get it out of that loop part and get you into action part. You understand where I'm going with that? It's hard to get out of the loop part because you assume it's complicated and there's lots of things to think about. What, what, oh, one more comment here. The thing we have to get people to understand is too many times when I talk to people about planning their estate, just planning what they want to do with their stuff after they're gone or after they're done farming, they get all balled up and their brain is just completely confused and completely turned into mush because they're thinking about, oh, what am I going to do? Is this an LLC or a trust or a will? Or what's this probate thing mean? And da, 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 they, get talk, they get confused and completely screwed up by all the tools that you have available to you when you do your estate planning. Don't think about tools. Don't try and fit, make something fit a trust or an LLC or an will or any of those things. You first of all think about, okay, I got stuff. I'm blessed to have a farm. I'm blessed to have machinery. I'm best blessed to have livestock. I'm best blessed to have my grandma's yellow pie plate or whatever those little intangibles are that you have around your house. What do I want to have done with those things? You think about what you want to do with that stuff first. What you like, in utopia, what would I like to have happen to? And by the way, you want to do this because Parents make two mistakes. Well, no, they make two assumptions that turn into mistakes. The assumptions that parents make are, number one, well, my kids are going to get along after I'm gone. It can be a bad assumption. Be careful about that. Be careful about my kids could be gone after I'm gone. Or my kids will get along after I'm gone. And the other one that's a bad assumption is, my kids will want to keep the farm in the family after I'm gone because it's been in the family for fill in the blank. Everybody's got that, right? Family up by northern, I won't say the town, northern Platte County. Nine kids in the family. Lady, lady finds out I'm taking this job. She calls me up and she said, Alan, I got a story to tell you. And I, she, says, and she said, I'm telling you this story because I want you to share it at your talks. There's nine kids in my family. We've gotten along great for 50, 60 years. We've attended everybody's birthday. We go to all the confirmations. We go to all the baptisms. We go to all the weddings. And we go to all the funerals. And now we'll never do that again. What happened? We had, an on, we had one of our brothers that was on farm with mom and dad. Mom and dad are now gone. And that brother plus three, of, three more, four of us, thought that he should be able to stay there on mom and dad's place. The other five, well, and what they did, the other five went something different. What they did is the four of them went and got the place appraised, and they were going to pay a fair market value to buy it for that son to be able to stay there, and they were going to pay the other five off. Got it? The fair market value was the fair market value, but it wasn't the biggest number you'd hear at the coffee shop. Follow the numbers there? They, they tend to not track. The coffee shop deal is a whole different deal. If you heard my other talks, I'm not going to talk about coffee shop. But I just, I just, you just know that. So what happened is the other five, because they knew those numbers weren't what they thought they, they should get, for whatever reason, I blame the coffee shop, but whatever. Um, they formed a kind of a false-fronted agency or false-fronted group, and they started bidding against the people. And then because the neighbor thought that they got it all through a you know realtor and stuff. The neighbor 
was never going to bid against brothers and sisters. He was never going to bid against the family. But because he had this other agency come into place or this other group come into place, he thought, well, it's not family. I can bid against them. And so they, they created this bidding war with the neighbor. The, the five of them created the bidding war with the neighbor. And they got the place up over 10000 bucks, and they sold it to the neighbor, and the family's not going to talk to each other ever again. Really? It's that important? Is it really that important, especially when you start dividing by nine? Okay. All right. So how are we going to do this? I think that if you're a farmer, you have, or even a business owner for that matter, you better begin with the end in mind. Uh, I got training my keys on retirement day. I'm done walking across the yard for the last time. I either park the tractor in a shed or park the tractor in an auction line, and I'm bringing my keys in to turn them into somebody else. Who am I turning my keys into? Am I key turning it into my son or my daughter or somebody else, or my nephew or somebody else that's going to continue farming? Am I turning my keys into? The auctioneer who's going to sell my place, or am I returning my keys into my next renter or to whoever I've got designated to take over? Think about that first. And also think about with that, who are you turning keys into? Also think about how big is my place? How many acres did I amass? How, how many how much livestock did I end up with? What does that end look like for you? Because that's important because if you know what the end looks like, then you could kind of work backwards or work forwards or whatever, how you want to look at that to figure out what the, rest of the, what the rest of your career looks like. Establish that vision first. Because what it helps you do is it let you take your remaining time in your farming operation, 5, 10, 20 year segments. You plan that out so you want to know what you want to look at for retirement. A farmer came to me recently and said, I'm 58 years old and I've had a chance to buy a place that I would love to farm, but the family wants $9,000 an acre. And at my age, I'd have to mortgage everything to keep, generate enough leverage to go buy that for maybe 8500 maybe 8200 but they're probably not less than that. And I'd have to work the rest of my life just to get out of that debt. For what? I'd have to work way harder just to cover another 200 acres. And I don't have a son coming back into the farm or a daughter coming back into the farming operation. I have no one coming into my farming operation. Just to make my estate bigger? My estate's worth several million dollars already. Why would I have to make it bigger? And I got plenty to do. I got 100 cows. I got 1,000, 1,200 acres of ground. I don't need more. So he passed on the opportunity to buy this ground. But because that person was grounded with their vision at the end, they knew what their vision looked like, and they didn't have a son or daughter coming back into the farming operation, that made that decision relatively easy to make. You follow where I'm going with that? Does that make sense to you? There's far too many alpha male farmers that think, oh my God, I got 200 acres offered to me. I have to buy it. Uh, yeah, no, you don't. Especially at 58 years old. Now, if you're 38, that, you know, all bets are off the table probably. So the thing we have to understand is I've got a couple things going on in this slide. I think that I don't have this, this part here on your slides. I don't think I put that part on your slides. I kind of thought about that after I got these, done sending these to Tyler last week. But the older generation is going to need a place to live, especially if you're bringing somebody back. Now, I'm talking about if you're bringing somebody back in your operation, a son or daughter, or other family members, or other people, even a hired hand. Older generation is going to need a place to live. They have to think about what they're going to do with their stuff. They have to think about what they need for retirement, their lifestyle. And by the way, the older people should be allowed to travel now. If they want, if they want a couple thousand bucks to go to Jamaica for a winter, some week in winter, they should be able to get a couple. You know, there should be some money built in for that. Those kind of things. The younger lifestyle needs money too for what they want to do. Growth of business, attitude towards debt, ownership versus writing, family time versus work. And interestingly enough, that younger family's budget, well, all of, our, all of our budgets right now, all of our older and younger families' budgets have got a $100 to $400 hole in them per month that we didn't have 20 years ago. And we, I don't think that a lot of the older generation have considered that. The hole in a budget that wasn't there 20 years ago is to all the technology. The data plan and the smartphone and, and uh, Dish Network and all those kinds of things. Just flat not there 20 years ago. When you consider both families on a farm. 
The other thing I'm running into is that we have to consider this carefully on what we need to run here because I'm getting guys with, like the farmer that I talked about north of Wahoo, he only had about 12, 1,400, well, not only, he had 12 or 1,400 acres of ground. Nice, nice size farm. Very good for him. But he had two sons talking about coming back to help him farm. So is 12, 1,400 acres going to support a second family or a third family? They'd have a heck of a time supporting a second family. No way on a third family. Not happening. Not with all the expenses you got going. All right? And the other thing I talked about him very carefully with is this bottom line down here. I said, you got, oh, wait, see, so here's the deal. He's saying, well, I think the only way we could make it is to borrow a million and a half, put up one of these chicken barns. I didn't disagree with that. That's, that's one of the options you have, obviously. That's obviously an option you would have. So I, here's what I said. I said, hey, wait a minute. You better make darn sure that whoever, whichever son, probably not both, but whichever son was coming back to help you has thought through this line down here, and specifically that word right there before you invest a million and a half dollars into a chicken barn. You better test them to know if they're going to stick with the farming thing and not leave you with chicken chores for the next 10 years. At 62 years old. That'd be a bad deal. <laughs> you wouldn't like that very much. But the, the farmer that's staying on the farm has got to recognize, and the son that's going to stay on the farm has got to recognize this whole thing exists. In other words, <coughs> we have to get that son through some kind of testing, son or daughter into some kind of testing phase. Are they going to, son and son-in-law, are they going to handle it? Are they going to want to stick with it? And do they, will they, are they willing to do the stuff that's not fun, like haul manure, pitch manure, uh, fix fence, those, those, those chore things, those, those menial jobs. As the older generation, is that all they're going to have them do, or are they going to let them do some of the fun stuff too, like getting in the tractor and push the button and let it go through the field? Got the testing phase. Management transfer phase. <coughs> um, I'm running to, well, I got somebody that I'm relatively good friends with that his dad is 71 or 70 or 71 years old. Brad knows who I'm talking about. And, and his dad won't let him make any management decisions. His dad poo poos everything he suggests. And this kid's 30 now. This guy's 30. And he's been with his dad every, every step of the way. And his dad's saying, um, no, we're not going to do it that way. I'm in charge around here. There has to be some recognition that management has to transfer. And then we have to get into asset or enterprise transfer, and that would be transferring machinery, transferring livestock, that sort of thing, and then whole farm or, or land transfer, business transfer at some point in time, too. I, won't, I don't have time to, to, to flesh all that out, but there's quite a bit of stuff that goes right into that last line that you kind of have to be thinking about if you're going to do this for another person in your operation. <clears throat> the other thing that's going on is that we don't tend to understand. I'm sorry, I'm starting to cough, so I'm going to get my my fizz here to, to burn it out of my neck. Um, the other thing we have to understand is that uh, generations have different values put on stuff. And the value, generation of values come from what happened to you from your age 12 to 20, junior high, high school, and the first year or two of college. The formative years define how you look at your life. So there's four generations that are working in a workforce right now. Although the matures are pretty much out, but the matures are our parents' generation. The baby boomers, my generation, the Xers are born between 65 and 80. Millennials be born between 80 and 2000. And the Generation Z, which is also now called I-Gen, little I-Gen, uh, they're still in high school. So I'm not talking about Generation Z. Four, their dedication, hard work, and sacrifice. They either had to grow up during World War II or the Great Depression, or both. And they had dedication to country, dedication to service, dedication to others before dedication anything for themselves. They delayed reward, they delayed gratification, and if it wasn't broke, you didn't fix it. I mean, excuse me, if you didn't buy new, if it was broke, you fixed it. Always fix stuff first. Never bought new unless you couldn't fix it. The boomers. My generation, because there's so darn many boomers and there's such a bump in the population that still exists, we had to compete. And we competed by working long hours. Our labor was our, our that was our currency. 
putting in the time was our currency. And so we value people that put in time with us. All right? I'm trying to shorten this up, Tyler. And then Generation X, the Xers are interesting because the Xers is the first generation of latchkey kids. And because they were latchkey, now that they have families and they're in the workforce, guess what? Family is more important than work. Family is not, not work. Putting in hours doesn't help them. They grew up on a computer. They can do things faster than I can, more efficiently than I can, better than I can. They're smarter than I am. have had better training than I've had. And so they can get things done more efficiently and quicker. But so time is currency, and currency means that they don't have to put in work. They want to put in time with their family. Unless you prove to them that family, that there's some, some reason for them to be somewhere, they just soon work from home or do something else because they can do it pretty efficiently. Millennials are a lot like Generation X, except millennials, the reason they're called millennials is because they started graduating from high school in the year 2000 or later. And millennials are cool because they not only have all those good training, technical schools, technical skills are really smart, and really to handle technology well. They also see the value of giving back to community. So millennials are cool because they do actually give back to community. They're actually trying to be helpful compared to, to the, excuse me, yeah, compared to Generation X. So here's my favorite picture, some of you have seen this before, of the difference between my mom's generation and my generation, my dad's, my, my parents' generation and my generation. The matures, oh, excuse me, I'll just tell the story like this. My mom and dad had kitchen cupboards like that when I grew up on the farm at Dorchester. Steel, painted white, silver handles. That's what we had. It must have been uh, products of the 40s and 50s, somewhere in there. Mom and dad moved into Crete in 1983. My brother got married. He moved from upstairs bedroom to the downstairs bedroom. And two or three years later, probably 85 or 86, they took those cupboards out and put in oak front cupboards. They just changed the design of the whole kitchen. They remodeled it, put in different cupboards. My mom was really frustrated by that, almost mad. She was ticked because the value of that generation said that unless there's something wrong with those cupboards, you didn't take them out or you didn't get rid of them. And there was nothing wrong with those cupboards. They were still fine. You, they had a little rust, but you could sand that off and repaint them. They were good. That's what my mom said. You want to change them a different color? Change them a different color. My mom says, why would you get rid of those steel cupboards? They were just fine. They were great. And that was the value of that generation. You didn't throw away anything unless it was so wore out you couldn't use it again. <clears throat> so guess what? The cupboards are fine out in my brother's machine shed holding grease cartridges and oil, oil filters and other, machine, other parts. They're just fine. They were still working great. The difference between my generation and the next generation down, or even the next two generations down, can be summed up in this slide, and I have to explain. In my generation, labor was putting in the hours is more important. So in the fall, when you're harvesting soybeans, I'm buying going. You kept the combine going, especially when it was time to be harvesting. But our Xers and our millennials, because family is first, will sometimes on 3 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, 3 o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, shut the combine down to go watch their junior high girl play volleyball. It makes the, it makes the matures, but especially the boomers, mad. What? Everybody knows the only reason the combine shuts down is for the Huskers. <laughs> and we didn't even shut it down this year. We didn't have to do that this year. Now, we hope for better things. Um, so anyway, we're hoping for better things. We're hoping the fall frost warning comes through, but there you go. All right. What happened here? Okay. We have to communicate. We have to communicate. We have to communicate. We have to communicate across family generations. Um, the younger generations are going to expect better communications than what we received, and I can talk about that right now real quick. We have far too many people in eastern Nebraska that are from Eastern European descent. I guess my name tag's over there, but Vanalek, Czech, all right? German, Polish. Name your ethnicity, Eastern European. What was the value of those, especially our parents' generation, when it came to talking about our business, our stuff, what we're doing. We didn't share that with anybody. That's my, that's my information and my information only. Well, guess what? I'm getting, I'm getting calls from people my age that have their parents 
in a nursing home, unable to talk to talk anymore. They're they're you know they're just in a nursing home. They're they're in bad shape. And they said, and my mom wouldn't tell me anything about what happened down on the farm. I've been gone for 40 years, and now I have to manage the farm. I don't know what I'm doing because mom didn't tell me anything. Because of that value that said you don't share your business with anyone and your kids. So we need better communication, especially when going across generations. So if you're going to talk about getting a farm transferred to the next place, you need to have some kind of communication across generations on how this is going to happen. In my utopia, especially when I took this job on July 1st, I assumed that what we should do is get the whole family together and have some kind of a beginning conversation about what should happen going to the farm to the next generation. And I assumed that you would get mom and dad, all the brothers and sisters, all the spouses, and even I even thought we should bring in all the grandkids that were of adult age, 18 or older, to be a part of that conversation. And they should all sit down and they should have a just a friendly little gathering of uh, what do you think ought to happen to mom and dad's stuff? What do you think of grandpa's and grandma's stuff? What should happen to grandpa and grandma's stuff? Everybody gets to say. And every time I tell that utopic view of what should happen, I get lawyers in the room, they're going crazy on me. Ain't going to ever happen. It's never happened yet. Everybody, all the lawyers just hate it. Why? Because there's always a personality that's going to muck up the whole conversation. What I want to have happen is I want an honest exchange of ideas and we, of things we could do with the farm and with the assets. But there's always going to be that outlaw, that in-law, excuse me, the in-law, or there's always going to be that grandchild, granddaughter, or whatever, that's going to have that weird thing. Well, you know, that, that south 20 acres, that 80 down there, it's always kind of wetlands anyway. Why don't you just give that to Sierra Club or put it into wildlife habitat or, or give, it to, give it to Ducks Unlimited or something? And all the alpha male farmers in the room are going to go, no, we farm our farm ground. We're not giving it to Ducks Unlimited. That's crazy. And so you get a fight going. That's what the lawyers are getting excited about. I say you have to structure your meeting properly. You have to say everybody today is allowed to just give ideas. No criticism. No evaluation. And nobody talk while somebody's talking. We'll pass around a talking stick if we have to. You can only talk if you have the stick or whatever you want to use. You have to decide on your family how you want that to happen. What I don't want to have happen is um, this guy up at Wahoo, I'm sorry I keep using him as an example, but he goes, I got two sons that are interested in farming, but I got one son that's not. My one son's out of state. He's not going to be interested. I'm not going to even, we're going to, we're going to talk. I'm going to sit down with my, with my two sons. My wife and I will sit down with my two sons. But I, we're not even going to worry about the kids that's out of state. I go, uh, no. That's not what I'd recommend. I'd recommend that you may not want him to necessarily drive down five, 600 miles to get to this meeting, but you better Skype him in. You better video chat him in. You better at least put him on speakerphone and let him listen to what's going on. He needs to be a part of that conversation. I think we're beyond that old value set from English and Germany and some of these other European deals that the oldest son got everything. We should be beyond that. But um, I'm hearing some stories, especially from some of the daughters that are going, well, mom and dad cut, my, the brother's on the farm. Mom and dad cut deals with my brother, and I don't know what they've cut over the years. I don't know what's going on. But the, they've given him livestock, or they've given him machinery, and they've never told me what they gave him. I, I, or they gave him a farm. They never told me what they gave him. I want to know those things. So that's the whole point. You better communicate about those things and keep your non-farm kids in place. The whole thing without transfer. And share with non-farm family members. <coughs> Sweetheart deals. Some of you probably heard my story about grandma on the pivot, so I have to be able to, have to think about that. I'll, I'll tell it different. You won't even know that you didn't hear it or heard it before. So grandma calls me up from uh, somewhere west of Columbus in, in about 2011, 2012, and she said, uh, I need to ask you about the management of my quarter that has a pivot on it. I said, okay. And this quarter was located in a place, and the land was good enough that in 2011, 2012, the cash rent on this quarter with a pivot on it should have been about 300 bucks an acre. I mean, that would have been the going market price. 
So I said, what's up, Grandma? And she said, well, my grandson's farming the farm with a pivot on it, and he's reporting to me that the pivot's wore out, shot, needs to be replaced. I said, so I have sense hesitancy. She said, yeah, I don't want to spend that kind of money at my age. I'm 80-something years old, and I don't want to spend that money. I need it for my end-of-life expenses. And uh, <coughs> she said, can I ask my grandson to just put the pivot on himself and give, you know, work out some deal with him? And I said, absolutely. I said, here, I, I talk about this all the time in my land management talks where you would just uh, discount the rent a little bit to, to reflect that uh, the owner doesn't have that pivot in there because in a typical lease, the owner owns all the irrigation equipment. So take your $300 lease and discount it. For a new pivot, you'd probably discount it between $45 and $60 per acre for 20 years. So instead of charging $300 lease, you may charge $250 or $240 or some number like that. And grandma goes on to say, I understand your math. I understand your logic. That all makes perfect sense. But here's my question. I said, what is it? She goes, how much do I discount the lease if my grandson's only paying me $150 an acre for rent? <laughs> and what I wanted to say was, Grandma, I'll give you $175, put the pivot on myself, but I kept my mouth shut. Um, I, and so, so, uh, uh, so we had to talk about that. Essentially, I ended up telling her, you know, I don't want to, well, Here's what, here's what I needed. Here's, here's, here's the point of telling that story. I'm not getting into the farm management side of that thing. I'm going to tell you this, the, the, this part of this. On the surface, it looks like grandson is not being fair to his grandmother. It doesn't look like he's being fair to his grandmother's estate, right? He's not being, unless, if he's, unless he's the only person left in the family. Unless, if his parents are gone, he's got no aunts and uncles, he's got no cousins, he's got no brothers and sisters. He's not being fair to his grandmother's estate, which includes all these family members, right? Well, that's a sweetheart deal. That's my sweetheart deal. Be careful about sweetheart deals and get the other end of the story. Get the other side of the story. Because here's what I'd love to do. I'd love to talk now to that grandson. I want to talk to the grandson. Get the other side of the story. Hey, grandson, you fixed that pivot? Yeah. Did you ever send grandma a bill? No. That pivot used to not go all the way around because you had a pasture over here, right? In this corner of the pivot of the farm? Yep. How'd that pasture get out of there? Well, I hired a bulldozer and we bulldozed it all in, and pushed the fence out, pushed the trees out. Did you send grandma a bill for the bulldozer? No. There's a farm out, there's a, there's a farmstead here that you're living on, yep. Yeah. And you're renting it from your grandma, yep. Yeah. You put a new roof on, yep. Yeah. Did your grandma pay for the roof or did you take care of it yourself? No, I paid for the roof myself. I put the siding on myself. I put the new windows in myself. I put the new rock in the driveway myself. Grandma get a bill for any of that stuff? No. I can see situations where 150 bucks is too much because he's covering expenses that grandma, as an own landowner, would probably usually pay. So be careful of the sweetheart deals and don't make assumptions. Do not make assumptions. Uh, okay. Listening is the key. Make sure you understand what they're trying to tell you. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. That's the seven habits of highly effective people, one of the seven habits. So it goes like this. Will you, will you, will you, will you uh, help me out here for a second? Are you sure. okay with that? Okay, good. Just tell me something. You don't even have to tell me the truth. Just tell me something, right? So what did you do last night? What did you do in the evening yesterday? Watch a ball game. And I was there, and it was awesome. We were stood the whole second half, and we were cheering, and the Huskers, instead of folding, they pulled away. It was great. Okay. Right. Did I hear what he had to say? No. I asked him the question about what happened last night so I could talk about being at the Husker game, so I could brag about that. By the way, people that do that to you when you're having conversations, probably not your real friends. Let's try that again. All right. So, what'd you do last night? Went to bed. Uh, <laughs> so, what time did you get to bed? After the Husker game or before the game? After the game. And so, did you watch the game? Yes, I did. And so, did you watch them at home or at a bar or what'd you do? Did you, have a, did you have a beverage with your game, or did you just uh, oh, all right, well, that's fine. And so what was impressive to you about the game? That they won. Yeah, I know. And so what did I say about, what did I say about my night that second time? What did I say about what I did last night? Nothing. What am I doing? I'm asking clarifying questions. All I'm doing is asking clarifying questions. So when you get that rogue daughter-in-law, or you get that rogue granddaughter that says, well, the South 20 acres ought to be given to the Ducks Unlimited, you don't go, you go, 
So what would be the advantage of giving that land to the wetland? What, what would be the advantage of creating wetlands? And what would be the what would be our, our, our advantage as the landowners to do that? Or what would be what would be some reasons that that's a good idea instead of attacking? You ask clarifying questions. Thanks, by the way. You ask clarifying questions, and you think about that. I would love to tell you the full Mark and Nancy story, but I'll, I'll abbreviate, abbreviate it quick. Mark and Nancy were, were 4-H parents that I knew in Iowa very well. Their kids were the same age as my kids. Mark and Nancy went to an Iowa State planning management, farm management planning session, and they talked about what was going to happen to their farm in about 10 years. Mark wrote down a whole bunch of stuff like, I'm going to have another tractor, I'm going to have this size, I'm going to have this much land, this much more land, this much, another pig shed, I'm going to have another hard man. Nancy wrote down, in 10 years, our kids are going to be out of high school. We're making a living now. We're busy enough now. We're going to, we just need to hold still for a little bit and enjoy our kids while they're here. It was as clear to me that Caleb and Philip, even in junior high, were never going to be farmers. Great kids, smart kids, wonderful individuals. They weren't going to farm. So she just said, let's enjoy our boys. Then the 10 minutes was up. They had their planning session. They compared papers, and then the fight began. You know, so make sure the parents are together on stuff like that and uh, make sure that you can stay away from <clears throat> some of the stuff that can you know, cause fissure if you have your family meeting if mom and dad don't agree. But, but to be true, let's, I'll get to that in a second. To be true about this, there's one thing I haven't told you yet. The thing I haven't told you yet is that when you have this family meeting, you should only gather input once, right? Grandpa and grandma, all the brothers and sisters, all the spouses, all the kids that are, all the grandkids that are adult age. You only do that once. Everybody has a chance to have input. No evaluations made, no plans made, just give input. Then you get rid of all the riffraff. You get rid of all the grandkids, you get rid of all the spouses. And you either keep mom and dad there alone next meeting, or you get mom and dad there with their, just their children, no spouses, and you say, now we're going to do some more sorting on this thing. And then you get to a third meeting, <clears throat> and the third meeting should follow the golden rule. And the golden rule is, you who has the gold makes the rule. So if, if mom and dad have the gold, they make the rule. If the your mom and dad and the children, their children have the goal, they make the rule. The golden rule has to apply here, but I think everybody should have a chance for input first. That's my point. You do it however you got to do it. I've got a sister-in-law that's already said, when mother-in-law passes away, she's not coming to clean the house out. She doesn't want to be there for the sale or the auction. Just send her a check. And I used to feel bad about that. Now I don't, because at least I know where she's at. I, 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 now it's great. It's awesome. I, I, I can live with that very easily. And so, the, you know, you need to, that's part of that, uh, uh, let's decide if we're going to have a family before we start the rest of the conversation type of thing. The other thing that has to be kind of figured into some of this farm stuff is that the goal of the Eastern European descendants of ours, or the predecessors of ours, we're the descendants, uh, was that uh, your, your value, your family value said, especially for our parents' generation, our family value said that if there's four kids and we're transferring assets to those four kids, we transfer those assets equally. 25, 25, 25, 25. And it doesn't make any difference if one kid's been on the farm for 50 years helping mom and dad, you transferred the assets equally. That was always the value of our parents' generation. I'm, I'm suggesting that fair may not always be equal. It depends on whether that on-farm sieve has, been, has put that sweat equity in and it seems to be, um, if they've, have they been adequately compensated for that contribution over 50 years. They tend to want to, to divide that equally, but is that fair? In some cases, yes, and each, each situation is different. No one solution to discussion. The most important thing to tell you about the fair versus equal discussion and the on-farm versus off-farm kid part of this discussion is that there's always a perception gap. I don't think it's on my slides. Nope, not on my slides, the one I cut out. But I'll tell you this right now. There's a perception gap, meaning that the on-farm kid, if you asked him, he or she, if you asked them what the contribution to that farming operation is, they all think, I've been the champion of this thing. I help mom and dad out. My contribution's 10 out of 10 because it's my work, my sweat equity, my technology, all the stuff I brought into here and made this place a successful place. And we're as big as we are because I've been here helping mom and dad. 
And all the off-farm kids are going to go, uh, well, little Johnny put in some sweat, but he's just riding on mom and dad's coattail. And, uh, you know, yeah, well, we'll give him some recognition, but they, they rate his value at about four or five, not anywhere close to 10. There's always going to be that perception gap. That's my point. The on-farm child is going to make have these all these ideas of what they contributed. The off-farm kids think, oh, they just rode off of mom and dad's coattail. Mom and dads were always the brains, the brains of the operation. So understand that there's going to be that gap there. You got to figure out um, how you're going to bridge that. And the truth, of course, is somewhere in the middle, but you got to figure out how you're going to bridge that. So uh, one thing that Dave Gaylor wrote, Dave Gaylor was my predecessor with the university. Dave Gaylor's still around. He's still helping with farm mediation clinics. But uh, one thing he wrote was this slide, and I like it very much. He said, you got four children, instead of going 25%, you consider creating a fifth, fair, fifth share. And that fifth share then goes to the on-farm kids. So each, instead of each kid getting 25, they get 20. And then for the fifth, for the fifth share, it goes to the on-farm on kids. So he gets two shares, so it would be 40% instead of 25. The other ones get 20 instead of 25. And that's, that's huge because if I got... If I got 25% equity into an operation and I want to buy my brothers and sisters out, can I go to a bank or farm credit and get money to, to buy everybody out at 25% down? Nope. If I have two shares now, if I have the 40% equity, depending on how the land's priced, obviously, but if I have 40% equity and I could go to farm credit or a bank, and guess what? They will give me the loan to buy my brothers and sisters out. If, I, if that's the objective, that's what we're going to do. You know, the big thing is here, we have to, the th big thing that bothers me a little bit about this job and a little bit about how I'm going to attract, I mean, I've only been into the six months, so I feel like I'm still starting. But the big thing that I concern, concerns me is I'm trying to get through this deal without having people my age come to me and say, well, this stinks. I say, why does this stink? Well, I spent the first 15 years of my farming operation paying off my dad's brothers and sisters, and now I'm going to spend the last 20 years of my farming paying off my sons and daughters that aren't on the farm. We gotta avoid paying for this ground twice in our lifetime, same ground. That's what we have to figure out. That's, and I, don't, I haven't figured out how to traverse that yet. That's the part that's frustrating to me about this job a little bit, okay? We gotta think about creative ways to handle that. So uh, these are the things I tried to say, communicate well, make sure siblings know what's going on. Uh, Tenants, if not siblings, should know status, their status. They should know what's going on with them. Have a family meeting. Be ready to, be ready to gather input, but don't make, don't make decisions on input and don't be critical of input. Get the end-of-life decisions in place. Fair is not equal good luck. Here's your homework assignment. Your homework assignment is to do two things. One, put your team together. Your team for making these end-of-business decisions, as you're talking about farm transition or farm succession, is to get a lawyer, banker, Financial advisor, and I've been told that I shouldn't have CPA on the same line with financial advisor. It should be its own line. I, I'm fine with that. I don't care. Your, peep, your dollar people, those people, and your insurance person, uh, part of your team. And the insurance person I'm talking about is someone that can help you with long-term care decisions and uh, maybe even life insurance. To, you know, a, lot of farms, a lot of farmers are considering life insurance for those off-farm kids to, uh, to cover uh, it's compensation for the on, you know, for the for the person that's staying on the farm. So, do you get to get to that get together that team? The other things you need to get together before you see an attorney's list of your assets, what you own, how you own it, how what you owe if anything, and what you want to do with your assets. Before you go to the attorney, get this pulled together. And when you pull together your list of assets, be sure that you. Keep things separately. In other words, if I own this farm under an LLC and this farm under a sub uh, chapter, the corporation C Corp or this under an S Corp, keep all your assets different according to how their entities are put together. And, uh, or if you just have them all with right of survivorship with your wife, that's fine. Put them all under one list. No problem. Just get everything listed and uh, all your debts, all your assets, um, all those things. And then you can go see an attorney. That, and yeah, your stocks, bonds. Savings bonds, all that stuff. Get it all listed out, what's your assets, what you own, how you own it, and then get have that list to go to your attorney, especially with knowing what you want to do with it, and you'll be in good shape. That's your homework assignment. I might be done. 
I'm like, oh, yeah. To get more information, this is in your handout, so I'm glad it's there. There's some good articles written by Joe Habacher, an attorney in Omaha. There's good articles at the Beginning Farmer Center at Iowa State. There's good articles at Ag Letters, Ag, Agra Letters, Legacy, their blog. The good articles at Purdue. And there's a decent set of articles at Minnesota. I just don't have, <coughs> University of Minnesota has good stuff too. I just don't have it listed up here. Also, you can, if, you're, if you're a cheap, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna say cheap. If you, if you want to, the way, the way to get yourself started on this is to consider going to uh, make an appointment with the Rural Response Hotline to see Joe and Dave, Joe Haubacher and Dave Gaylor. They still come into around and do the mediation clinics. You get an hour with a lawyer and a financial guy for free. Dave's the financial guy, Joe's the lawyer. And you get an hour with them for free. I'd call that number and make get an appointment. If they have enough people from Lincoln that want to come and see them, They'll, make, they'll schedule a clinic here at Lancaster County, and, and they'll come in a day and meet with people. Joe and Dave, Joe, Joe Haubacher, Dave Gaylor, and it's an awesome, awesome resource. You get an hour with them for free to check your plans, get you started, look at what you got going on, that sort of thing. You, can, you also got my phone number. It's on the first slide, especially for people in Lancaster County. If somebody wants me to come talk with husband and wife or something like that, or husband and wife and kids or something, I, I can do that too. I'm not opposed. As a matter of fact, it's good practice for me. Not practice. It's good. It's good. It's good reality. It's a good reality check for me. And then there's also a beginning farmer hotline. Use that number. If you have a beginning farmer in your operation, I don't have the slides in. I got to be done. Sorry. But if you have a beginning farmer in your operation, just understand that there's a beginning farmer tax credit for leasing, 10% off of uh, cash leases, 15% off of crop share leases uh, as a tax credit to the landowner. So don't miss that opportunity. Uh, make sure make sure you qualify, but don't miss that opportunity. Questions? I didn't. Nobody asked me any questions. Go ahead. Is that tax uh, credit is it for outside of family members? No, it could be family. It could be within family members. The, 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 quali the qualification, I think, is that you got to be less than ten years of farming and less than uh, one hundred fifty thousand in assets or a equity. First ten years of farming and less than so much equity. You have to look it up on the website. It's the Nebraska Beginning Farmer Act. By the by, the legislature. I think it's a state tax credit, but hey, it's something. Excuse me. No, no, no. It's beginning farmer. And then they'll they'll go back and look to see if you filed a, you know a farmer tax. I mean, you know, a, a income a tax statement that has the schedule F or whatever it is. I'll be around. You can ask, grab me and ask questions or tell me your story or whatever. It doesn't matter. Thanks very much. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can hang around until we can ask questions. But, uh, so right now we're going to...